Welcome to the podcast CDCI Connects. Uh, my name is Rachel Cronin, and I am the finance manager and HR manager here at the Center on Disability and Community Inclusion at UVM. And my guest today is Melissa Cronin. Melissa is a writer and author whose work has been published in the Washington Post and the USA Today, among many other places. Um, she's also a musician and an avid gardener and an impressive contributor to our family's karaoke nights. <laughs> Great. She also happens to be my stepmother. Uh, Melissa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you. Um, so CDCI Connects is a way for us at CDCI to be in conversation with people in the disability community. So I've, the first thing I want to ask you is just to tell us a little bit about yourself, but maybe through the framework of what is your relationship to disability? Well, um, it is the result of a traumatic brain injury um, that I sustained, uh, was it 18 years ago now? Um, and so that's how I entered the disability world. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't until three years after actually my injury that I was diagnosed with a brain injury. So the initial stages of it, you know, I didn't think about it in terms of disability. And, you know, it wasn't until after I was diagnosed and then after, um, how do I say this? Disability, it's funny, you know, like I think of the term disability as something that's, it's coined through, like it's more of a, through social security, like it's a term that, you know, to qualify. And so, I, um, until I officially was told that I am disabled, prior to that, it was, I was, you know, it was kind of a gray area, but now, you know, once it was kind of official on paper, it's, it became more real. So I can say, yes, I have a disability, um, but that's how it came about, you know, my brain injury and having issues with PTSD. So that's, okay. does that answer? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think a lot of people deal with disability in that way where they're thinking about, you have to qualify for a certain level of benefits, right? And so like, you have to like fit to a specific diagnosis or you have to fit to a specific definition of what it is. Mm -hmm. But um, so for you, you sustained an injury, which, you know, later on was determined to be a traumatic brain injury. Um, and it sounds like you've always sort of, or you have been sort of like, not sure if that's a term you would use to identify yourself with. Like, right. would you identify as a person with a disability or do you feel like that's not a term you would apply to yourself? I do, I do now, yes. It, I think it, it took some time to come around to that, even though, like I said, on paper, you know, you're considered disabled. Um, at first it was like, hmm, you know, I think it was a denial kind of um, process. And also I think because I look, I don't, how do I say this? A lot of people say, you have said to me, wow, you look great. Or you don't, you never look like you were hit by a car, which is how my brain injury came about. So I, would translate that to mean, well, am I making this up? Maybe, you know, this isn't real. So I struggled with that, but I do now, you know, over the past several years, it took a while to come around to this, but I do identify, yes, with, a dis that I, with the disability community and that I do have a disability. Um, as much as I sometimes choose not to talk about it, depending on the circumstances, especially like with potential employment or in situations that it might mean, it might mean that like I'm excluded from something. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, there's still that denial, you know, like, oh, I can do this. And well, maybe I shouldn't or you know, I'll give it a try. And if I fail, so up. But I'm also hesitant 
to fail, like to <laughs> experience. Right. right. Well, I mean, there's, so yes, there's like a lot going on there. I, I can relate to that so much. The idea of like being, it, when you have sort of like an invisible disability, which I mean, I mean, I, I don't know, if, I have a chronic illness, right? Like I have an autoimmune disorder, which has a lot of effects, but it is sort of an invisible illness that people don't see. And so that sort of like tension between wanting to advocate for yourself, but also feeling like you don't necessarily like deserve that sort of attention or, right. you know, it's, it's a, there's some tension with that. Yeah. Yeah. D that's, that's the real hard part of it all. Um, you know, and things come up, certain things, um, you know, whether it might be a workplace accommodation or a, you know, when I went back to school years ago um, to get my master's and, um, you know, it took a lot of pushing and encouragement from my therapist to say, you know, let them know your issues. And I, I didn't want to, because I felt like, well, maybe I'm overthinking it or I don't want them to think, I can't do this, you know, I, I won't succeed. You didn't but, want to be yeah, judged, basically. Right, yeah, or again, you know, looking at me and thinking, well, really, I never would have guessed, or, um, you know, I, so that, that's hard, you know, yeah. I think sometimes it still is, but um, not as much as it used to be. I think I'm, I've gotten better about it. Um, not always, but I think, yeah. You talked about going back to get your master's degree, which was, uh, how many years ago was that? Um, you got your master's? So I, I finished in 2000, January of 2013. Right. So nine, a little over nine years ago. So what was that process like? So previous to the injury, you were a nurse. Right. Right. Uh, like an ER nurse? No, uh, a baby nurse. Uh, in the neonatal intensive care unit, yeah. Neonatal intensive care unit, right. So both of those things together. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and and you sort of left that career. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like you left that, you left that career because of, as a result of the injury, right? You couldn't, yes. you, it was too, too much of a challenge with your disability to like maintain working in that kind of environment. Right. At first it was the, you know, the physical part of it. Oh, right. Yeah. Cause you had like a lot of PT that you were doing to right. just get back to. Yeah. Walking and strength. Um, and then it was more about multitasking, which I, you know, obviously I struggled with that. I should say obvious, but you know, the brain injury. <laughs> so, and having a lot of things thrown at me at once because I'm, you know, I'm slower I have to really think things through. So working in critical care is really not the ideal place <laughs> um, for someone who gets brain fog easily. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But so so we're, you went back to, to get your master's in writing, right? And in, yes. in creative writing, right? Not creative writing. Yes. Okay. MFA, yes. In nonfiction. Yeah. Your, your MFA, right? Your master's of fine arts in nonfiction writing. Mm -hmm. So was, was writing something that you had always been passionate about or was that a change in your career? Like was, was it something you discovered after leaving the healthcare field? It was something I discovered. I never thought, you know, as a kid, like, oh, this is my dream. I'm going to be a writer someday. Um, so no, I never would have thought of it until you know after this accident and trying to figure out what what am I going to do with my life and where am I going and I tried various healthcare settings once I could return to work part-time and it didn't work out I um you know I struggled a lot in the workplace in healthcare so I you know had kept a journal and then took a class at CCB, or like a writing research class, and loved it. And loved the you know the instructor was great. So I thought, okay, I enjoy writing, and maybe I can see where this takes me. And so I, the instructor of the class, she, I asked her to be my mentor for a while to help me with writing. 
and she did. So, and then I took some workshops and joined writing groups and I loved it and decided, okay, well, maybe I could go back to school. And the teacher that I had at CCV, she had gone to Vermont College of Fine Arts years earlier. So she suggested that I look into that, that they had a conference that was taking place. So I went to that and I just thought, okay, I'm gonna do this. It gave me a sense of structure, you know, something I had to, you know, to show up every day and do a certain amount of work and writing. And it, so it helped form my days and like, I thought, okay, I can. And then I decided, you know, I really wanted to write a memoir about this accident or based on the accident that I was part of. And so that became my focal point. And that's how I got into writing. And since then, you know, it's been more, you know, freelance and writing for local newspapers and like different um, publications. So yeah, otherwise I, I don't think I would have entered the writing world if it wasn't for my brain injury, you know, in this accident that occurred. Yeah. So that's how that came up. <laughs> it's sort of like a, you know, like a sliding door sort of moment. You know, you don't, I, it's hard to say that like having this injury that has greatly affected your life had a positive result, but like, right. Right. you know, I mean, of course you don't want to say that, but like, you know, yeah. I feel like there's so much in your life that could have gone totally differently if, you know, you hadn't been that, there that day and, and had that accident. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, oh, yeah, yeah, a lot. Much when we were talking before the podcast, we were talking about you were saying that there were like definite cons, and we've talked about some of those in terms of like how you're perceived by people and how you perceive yourself and those kinds of things. But you know, in terms of like pros and and how you've adapted, you know, mm -hmm. you you said something about having to be able to think outside the box, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I've, I've always been a curious person and interested in when something comes up that I don't understand or that that's interesting, I want to know more about it. So I think that helps. And so, yeah, I've, you know, all along I've felt like, okay, I need to figure something out and what, when something excites me, I try to, or along the way, I've tried to think, okay, is this something that's. I can sustain long-term, am I really interested in this? So I, I try it and see where it takes me, you know, like the gardening, <laughs> for instance, which I know that's something that really resonates and has, you know, really changed me or like I realize that this is something that belongs to me, it's kind of part of my world. Um, and it's kind of like caregiving, you know, it's like being a nurse because I'm taking care of plants and nourishing seeds and watering so it's it has that it's the same feeling in a way mm. which really helps yeah do you feel like I mean I don't know anybody <laughs> who can be so um committed to like learning a new task and yeah. like taking on um like you didn't do any gardening and now you've got this like beautiful garden and you make <laughs> you like the the I, I can't think of the word because I'm having my own moment here, but the uh, harvest from the garden was oh, so, so beautiful last year. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, I sometimes wonder if that aspect of that you have where you're like just super interested in learning something new and like developing a new skill set and also being committed to, to like succeeding at it. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've always had? Is that like who you always were? Or I, I sometimes wonder like what parts, cause I only know you post the injury, right. right? So like, I'm like, what parts of Melissa were there before and which parts are, are right. new parts of you? Yeah, I think that's always been who I am, a part of me. So that hasn't changed. Um, yeah, I've always been that way. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I would say so. So I, and I think, you know, to my benefit, that's helped along the way. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, 
I think, you know, so that comes with frustrations because I've always been hard on myself. And when I do something, I feel like I have to do it exactly right. <laughs> or else, you know, it's not good enough kind of thing. Right. Um, so, yeah. And, I, you know, I've had to learn that imperfection is perfect in its own way. Um, so I remind myself of that a lot or just say it's good enough you know that's all that's a great way to say it. imperfection is perfect in its own way I like that mm -hmm. um you sent me this thing before the podcast about the the no end in sight void and I oh, right. wanted to know if you what you wanted to talk about related to that or what your thoughts were around that or to explain it to the listeners who probably don't know what that is. <laughs> yes, you know, this is new to me. So, you know, I just happen to see it on Twitter. <laughs> and, you know, for people in the disability community, not, not only people with brain injuries, but people that have chronic illnesses um, that seem, you know, to others on the outside that seem vague or like I said, invisible. And how, you know, it's, it's chronic, it's every day, it's, and that, you know, the struggle to be seen and to be heard and understood. And so it's kind of this place for people to come together and talk and connect and, you know, brainstorm um, to understand one another and to try to help others understand, like, this is real what I'm going through. It's, you know, it's not, I'm not fictionalizing it or, you know, especially in healthcare when people, and especially with women, I think, you know, it's, you go to a doctor or any healthcare professional and they're like, okay, well, you know, it's probably menopause or something like that, it's, you know, right. Or you just had this major yeah. life change. So it could be. You're that. depressed. You should go to a therapist. You should. Well, yeah. Right. Well, of course, well, of course I'm depressed because <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. who wouldn't be? <laughs> So I'm depressed, but that's a result of this out of thing that's going on. It didn't come out of a void. Well, maybe it did, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I shouldn't say it because, you know, people do, there is depression in my family, you know, clinical depression, where it's, it's not necessarily linked to something specific. And I think that's the hardest part for people to understand. You know, when people look at you and they think, well, you have such a great life. You know, I've had that said to me, a, a friend from years ago who when I was really struggling after the accident. And she said, you know, everything's great. You've met this great guy, you're getting married, like things should be good. And I'm like, I know, I'm like, thanks. Like, <laughs> that had to have felt so diminishing. Like, it's like, yeah, you're not allowed to feel the things right. you feel, you know? <laughs> right, Which is so, yeah. yeah. So it's no wonder why people are afraid, you know, when you are struggling with something, a disability or, depression or an anxiety disorder or any of it that they are you know reluctant to say anything or pretend you're somebody else that someone you're really not um yeah so that's that's a hard part of it yeah I was just listening to this um podcast uh well an episode of fresh air with Terry Gross on NPR and I, I sent you the link to it but I, I, oh, yeah, I, I actually listened I did listen I listened to most did you listen to it yeah. yeah. It was so interesting. It, so the topic of it was um, ostensibly about long COVID. So like people who have gotten COVID and the people who are still struggling with the the kind of symptoms, which I didn't even realize what the symptoms were to long yeah. COVID. Um, but like the idea of like chronic fatigue and brain fog and these kinds of things, which are symptoms of my own chronic illness. And so I was like, I so I took a listen to this podcast and it was so, it, so ostensibly it's about long COVID, but then it becomes more about navigating a healthcare environment that is not set up to treat people in a holistic way. Right. So like, and the way that she was talking about it, I was so related to her. It's like, oh, you're having this issue. Here's the Here's how to fix that one thing. Mm -hmm. Like, here's this medicine to take, or here's to take, here's to do this thing. And there's nobody that's coming in and saying, actually, what you have is this other thing that like you need to treat you can't just treat the brain or the like hormone or the gland or the right. whatever. Yeah. You have to treat all of it together for it to be having a result. And it, we just don't have a medical system that's set up for that. And the idea that like women in particular, like, I think you're right. Like 
of course, mental health issues aren't a real issue. And that, you know, some people, the treatment is to seek mental health support, but like for some people, they go to the doctor and they're told over and over again, Mm. you have anxiety or you're just, you know, depressed or, you know, like, I don't know, I, like two different doctors told me to go see a therapist, which was like, I should see a therapist, but because of you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so um, I thought that was really, I think that's interesting. And in like the kind of like interconnectedness between disability mm-hmm. and chronic illness. And it, mm-hmm. I, I didn't realize that it was three years after your injury that you finally got yeah. after the accident that you finally got diagnosed like what was that process like between um yeah it was a little under three years it was um what happened was because I had returned to a workplace it was 14 months after the accident after you know I'd been in rehab and PT and I had returned to part-time work as a public health nurse it, a desk job mostly and there was some driving involved and it didn't take long before I found myself struggling with, you know, multitasking and, um, you know, I would be at my desk and I would shift papers from one pile to another and kind of (laughs) not really, you know, I'd get things done, but I needed a lot of guidance and, or I was very slow to understand things. And it was a lot of anxiety and I had been diagnosed with PTSD. So I assumed it was all related to that. And there's, there's an overlap between brain injury and PTSD because you know, sometimes the symptoms are similar or a lot of times. And also people that have PTSD, have PTSD could be the result of something traumatic, like a car accident. <laughs> so um, I had been in treatment for PTSD. So I just assigned it to that. And then when I was, I almost got fired from that job, but I quit. And then I took another job in a pediatrician's office, which was really- I remember that. <laughs> ridiculous I don't know what to not talk about denial so I was like I can do this and that was only 16 hours a week but that didn't last long because I just I couldn't handle the you know just the constant the multitasking the high paced fast-paced environment and so my job was threatened there and I ended up leaving and that's when I actually saw a specialist a neuropsychologist um, it was recommended by other um, healthcare providers. And um, so I went, underwent some intensive testing and it was determined that I had sustained a brain injury based on what I was experiencing and the kind of injury that I had, you know, where I was hit, you know, I had, I had, been, had been thrown and hit my left frontal lobe. So, and there was questionable bleeding on a CAT scan, not anything major, but there was questions. They were like, okay, so this probably is, or definitely is, they classified as a moderate brain injury, um, which surprised me because I thought, how could it be? You know, of course, I'm going to say that. Um, so that's how that all came about, um, you know, because I was put to the test when I tried to go back to work. And, um, So that's the whole trajectory of that. (laughs) It's just, it's interesting to me that it's not like given the nature of what happened to you, that when you're in PT and you're in rehab, that's not like a thing that they were testing you for then, you know, like did, or did they? They did. Well, they did. When I was in the hospital, they had somebody come and just, it was very um, surface testing, you know, count backwards from 10 and can you remember these 10 or whatever it was? And um, so it was very simple. And so, and I had so many other injuries that they were focused on that, you know, I had a ruptured spleen and things that they had to do to just save my life in the moment. So my brain was secondary because on the CAT scans, they didn't see any obvious bleeding. Um, And I didn't lose consciousness for very long or that I remember I, you know, I have um, amnesia memory loss from the accident, but um, so they accounted for that, but it wasn't a priority for them. And I think that's a problem, you know, not just for me, but for so many people that maybe sustain a concussion, which is a brain injury. People like, Oh, it's just a concussion. 
Um, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's like, no, it's not just. So, um, so I think that's where, you know, people fall through the cracks and they, and they struggle and struggle and years can go by and unless you have the right supports and you're connected, you, you just might never know. And then you're just frustrated forever. <laughs> right. And also, I mean, you have to advocate so hard for yourself, you know, like, yeah, yeah. You knew something was wrong and you had to like, you know, push it forward to be able to get the, the answers you wanted to get, you know, like it wasn't going to come without you doing like the hard work of figuring it out, you know? Right. And I was fortunate because I had, you know, a lot of support systems, you know, in place of therapist and, other, you know, that encouraged me to seek these options out. So I wasn't, you know, doing this solo. Um, so that was, you know, I don't know if I would have pursued it. I might've said, oh no, no, it's, you know, it's just me. It's my problem or, I mean, it is my problem, but I mean, it's me <laughs> just overthinking it or something. And um, so I think, you know, along the way over the years, I, it, I've had a lot of help. Um, and not everybody has that level of support. Right, right. And it's still hard. I, um, I've, you know, like I have visual processing issues. So I've been in and out of treatment for that. And that's a area of brain injuries that still needs a lot of work, a lot of people to um, be in that field and to kind of, for people to understand, you know, that this is part of the process that. Um, yeah, there's like not a lot of research around it. There is, but it's there's still a long way to go, especially here in Vermont. There aren't a lot of providers, or just like maybe one <laughs> that I know of, or two, and they're learning about you know what, how to diagnose it and to treat it, and you know I have it's a lot of um, how the brain connects to your you know your eyes aren't separate from your brain, like your gut is not separate, everything's connected, right, <laughs> and so. I hadn't thought about that until the recent years when I was, because whenever I'm outside, like, especially in the fall, if I'm walking, there's a lot of brightly colored leaves. I, I'm very hesitant. Like, I feel like I'm going to slip or I'm going to fall. And it's just, it's my spatial relationship kind of with, with the leaves. <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, no, I get it. Yeah. Like your environment, you're, you're yeah. not processing it. And so you're not, you're not sure where the like solid ground is. Right. 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 Yeah. So yeah. the weird. Do you thing. feel like there's a, like a general, like, I don't know. I mean, when I was a kid and growing up, I don't feel like there was a lot of this sort of like preventative healthcare, um, self-advocation for yourself if you're not feeling well or those kinds of things. I, I feel like there's been a shift a little bit in the, in the medical world where people are starting to realize that, like you said, you have to you can't just treat the brain. There's like, it's connected to your eyes. It's connected to your, you know, that yeah. what you eat affects your brain, you know, like yeah, those, those, I think if I were to say that 20 years ago, what you eat affects your brain, people would be like, uh, oh, you're nuts. <laughs> you know, like, I don't right, think right. That. Yeah. So do you feel like there's a, like a move towards thinking more holistically about health? Um, I do. I definitely do. Um, because I think also, you know, maybe even a decade ago, I might've been reluctant to say something to my primary care doctor about, well, I want to take this supplement or, you know, and now, you know, the primary doctor I have, she's great. I, I feel comfortable saying, well, I, you know, I want to try this or I take, you know, like I take lavender supplements at night to help be with sleep because I, I've gone through periods of time where I have very vivid, violent dreams and lavender has been shown to help um, calm that. And that was only because I went to a, um, a naturopath. And so I think there's more and more people that are practicing that. And there's more availability of, um, providers that are open to those kinds of treatments that especially food, you know, diet related, you know, um, you know, I've learned a lot about healthy fats and, you know, I remember years ago, I don't, you know, people were like, don't eat fat, you know, like eat pretzels and eat whatever, drink diet Coke. 
or tab, whatever. And, <laughs> and now, you know, I was of that thinking. And now, you know, I've learned over time from a um, specialist I went to for my visual processing. She actually, a few years back, was the one that told me, try not to eat so much gluten, have, you know, like healthy fats, and you need that for your brain. And I was like, oh, okay. So I try to... I do that, you know, I eat avocado every day. <laughs> and, and these are things that I think 10 years ago, 50, you know, it was kind of, no, I, I don't know. Yeah. People just didn't buy into it. And it, I think that's part of the feeling about, like, especially, like, I hate it when I go to a, a restaurant and I order something gluten-free and the server's like, do you have an allergy? Mm-hmm. Like, and I know they're just checking because they need to make right. sure that they like do the right things in the kitchen. And I always, am like, do I, do I go into like my whole health history for them? Do I explain right. that I have, I have an autoimmune disorder, but it's not celiac. So it's not going to really kill me. Like, I feel right. like that's my like, yeah. And so that's, that's part of that feeling of feeling like the thing you're dealing with because it's sort of invisible, people can't really see it that when you have to step up and say, well, this is a thing I do. And everybody looks at you sort of like, is it <laughs> like, right. Right. You know, like you have to convince people that taking lavender at night, even though it's a, you know, Mm. that it makes sense because it works for you, you know? Yeah. 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 It's like, yeah. People look at you like, oh, you're just jumping on the bandwagon. (laughs) You know, you're just like, because everyone says to do it. So do it. It's like, no, this is, this works. Um, So, yeah, but I, I think we have a long way to go in terms of the holistic medicine field, maybe. Um. I think, you know, physicians, especially that are, are healthcare providers that are new to the field or entering, they're, you know, maybe there is, I don't know, like in medical schools or in nursing programs to have more of a holistic track, so to speak, or, you know, that there's a focus on that, an emphasis um, as you enter the workplace. So, because there's more and more people that are seeking that out, those alternatives. Yeah, I thought that was another interesting aspect of the NPR episode um, or the Fresh Air episode where, um, well, one, she talked about the doctor. I, can't, I don't have the woman's name off the top of my head. Who I know was I, the, can. Yeah. I can look it up. <laughs> but she talked about how she started seeing a doctor that was, you know, trained, like could write a prescription, trained in like the standard Western medicine, but also had experience and had been trained in being a naturopath and like being like more of a holistic healthcare professional. Um, and what a great combination that was. And I'm so lucky that I found someone like that here in Vermont too. And, you know, not to mention the like health insurance I have that allows me to Mm. to kind of explore these different things to try and pinpoint what's wrong. But, um, you know, she also said in that, that podcast interview that, there's like a huge increase in the, in the kinds of diagnoses that people are seeing of these sort of chronic illnesses or, um, you know, these sort of invisible things, <laughs> like more and more people are getting diagnosed with these sort of autoimmune disorders and that kind of stuff. Right. And I'm like, is it, is it that more and more people are actually getting sick or have those things? Or is it that we are better at having that empathy of like, believing people when they say they're not feeling well <laughs> you know right. like was it yeah. always this way yeah. yeah I think about that it's funny I was just thinking about that earlier today that because you know as I was preparing for this thinking how over time I've been willing to speak out about it more you know be more vocal about my disability I've become more comfortable even though I'm still uncomfortable sometimes it's you know because there are more and more people out there that I've connected with, you know, with social media makes it easier. And I mean, that can be a bad thing too. (laughs) (laughs) Go wild with that. Um, So yeah, I wonder about that. Um, Yeah, I was just trying to look up the... um, Oh, then... uh, Oh, yeah. Megan O'Rourke is her name. Yes, yes. Um, Who's, who wrote a book... Mm-hmm. I'll tell the name of for people who are interested if it's in the book. The Invisible Kingdom is the name of her book, Megan yeah. O'Rourke. 
Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm so I'm interested to read that book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, speaking of um, more people talking about invisible disabilities or just disability in general and mental health issues and autoimmune issues, um, I find that there are more and more books coming out about that or writings. And maybe it's just because I'm attentive to it or just, you know, my little flag goes up whenever I hear the term related to, you know, disability um, in the writing world. It just, it seems like there's more out there to access in terms of reading about it or listening, you know, podcasts. Do you feel like your memoir that you're writing uh, like taps in these kinds of conversations in terms of like healthcare or? Um, yes, especially, you know, the invisible, invisible, disability aspect of in, or injury. Um, yes, it definitely does. You know, the process and what you go through to find, you know, get a diagnosis and how to deal with it and sort of, you know, the red tape and the whole bureaucracy of um, gaining what you need or, you know, access. Yeah, de definitely, yeah. 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 Well, uh, I, I mean, I feel like I've hit on all of the things in my notes. I don't know. Have you, how do you feel? <laughs> no, I feel good about it. Um, I know I took a lot of notes. I just think that, yeah, this is a good conversation. I think, I hope, you know, want others to benefit. Um, I think the biggest thing is for people that don't understand disability or, um, especially invisible disabilities and to try to listen to those who are struggling and take it upon yourself to learn rather than be quick to say, oh, you know, yeah, I have that too. Yeah, I get brain fog or yeah, I forget. Yeah. <laughs> I know, yeah. Sometimes I worry that I do that to you because like- Yeah, I'm sure we don't. Yeah. You know, that we'll, we'll be talking, we'll be talking about you know, things that are symptomatic to your, to your disability. And I'll be like, oh man, I totally relate to that, <laughs> you know? And, um, but it, I, I know it's a, it's a very different thing. Um, and I think you're right that people are often dismissive of those kinds of things like brain fog or, um, you know, oh, she's just, she's just not as quick at picking things up as other people, you know, like they don't, they don't think mm -hmm. about it as, uh, Mm -hmm. a thing that you're struggling with, you know, right. they just think it's who you are, you know? Right. right. And I mean, I think it's okay for people's, you know, I can relate to that. It's nice to have the connection with someone who can share the same symptoms or same experiences, because then you, you don't feel so much alone. You're like, okay, I'm not crazy. <laughs> you know? Right. This is real. Um, so there is, that can be helpful. It's more about kind of the dismissiveness, like you said, the Oh, uh, don't worry. You're fine. You know, everybody forgets things once in a while. It's like, okay. <laughs> right. And yeah. Like in general, just like being able to be more empathetic with people who might yeah. have a different life experience than you do. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah I think that's okay. Where can people find you online, Melissa? I'm on Twitter, Instagram. Some, I haven't been on Facebook as much. Actually, Instagram. that's probably a good thing. <laughs> I'll say these days, Twitter, um, my website, melissacronin.com. And yeah, that's probably. <laughs> yeah, the, the website, melissacronin.com links to a lot of your writings too. If people are curious to read more about yes. your thoughts around lots of different things. Right. And I have a newsletter that I come out with once a month and so on my website, like people can sign up for that. And it doesn't, it's not just about brain injury. It's about just different things. Interesting. I love your newsletter. And there's always such great <laughs> tips for like new things to read or watch or think yeah. about. Yeah. So that's, it's kind of, it's short and easy. So it doesn't take up too much bandwidth and <laughs> much space on your computer or your email. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me. Well, thank you. This is fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
the University of Vermont Center on Disability and Community Inclusion. We support, we teach, we study, we share, we connect. Find out more at go.uvm.edu slash cdci.